Imagine you just heard the words, you have cancer or any other type of disease that needs treatment. I heard those words and my heart sank and my fear rose. However, I also knew that whatever medical care I needed would not be far away. I live in Los Angeles now with some of the best medical care options. And prior to that, I lived in a suburb of Boston, also another amazing medical community. In fact, I often consult with an oncologist at the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute in Boston while having my on-the-ground team, a combination from UCLA and Cedars here in L.A., two teaching and phenomenal medical facilities treating my cancer with the most updated research and information. But what if I weren't so lucky? What if I lived in a rural area where access was limited or just not available? What could I do? We all need medical care, and many of us live in areas that are outside of catchment areas of great medical opportunities and care for us. What choices do we have then, and what options do we have if we don't have the financial means to take us to those faraway medical facilities? Welcome to Small and Gutsy, our podcast featuring nonprofits and social impact organizations under $10 million. My name is Dr. Laura Whitkoff, and I'm excited and proud to be your host. We hope you'll love the stories as much as we do, and perhaps you will find needed services, a job, volunteer, invest in, or donate. And for all of you followers, Small and Gutsy has just been granted nonprofit 501c3 status. We are thrilled to have moved in this direction, enabling us to continue to meet our vision of interviewing as many smaller nonprofits and social impact organizations as we can. So please pass along any valuable information you hear today to others and send me the name of any organization you'd like featured at lwitkoff at gmail.com. That's two T's and two F's. Transportation challenges create one of the most daunting barriers to healthcare, a barrier second only to the cost. Every day, Angel Flight West's volunteer pilots fly people to their medical appointments at no cost to the passenger. Yep, that's what I said, no cost. On the ground, Earth Angels drive passengers from the airport to the medical facility, also free of cost. Founded in 1983, this incredible organization you'll hear more about in a moment Angel Flight West delivers health and hope using donated flights to serve those with health care or other compelling human needs. In the air, Angel Flight West links volunteer pilots and commercial airlines with people whose non-emergency health needs require air transportation to access care. On the ground, volunteer drivers ferry passengers to and from their departure and destination airports. In fact, My husband Mark and I have recently signed up to be Earth Angel drivers, but because of my own current medical needs, I haven't been able to sign up for an actual mission to drive yet, but I'm excited to be available to transport folks this fall and plan to very soon. Angel Flight West, AFW for short, is a nonprofit volunteer-driven organization that arranges free non-emergency air transportation within the 12 Western states for children and adults with serious medical conditions and other compelling needs. AFW matches volunteer pilots and drivers to people in need, enabling them to receive medical treatment and other essential services that might otherwise be inaccessible because of financial, medical, or geographic circumstances. Angel Flight West has spent four decades, yep, four decades, over 40 years. They actually recently had their 40th anniversary this past summer and has provided more than 99,000 missions and over 3,000 this year alone, creating pathways to healthcare across the Western United States, arranging donated flights to people in need and providing them safe passage to and from medical care for over 20,000 passengers. Although Angel Flight West is best known for linking passengers to valuable medical resources, they also provide transportation for other humanitarian purposes, such as individuals and families escaping domestic violence, disaster relief, therapeutic programs for veterans and children's specialty camps. And in fact, I believe I heard a story recently where they rescued puppies from a euthanizing state and flew them to be adopted here in LA. I am so excited to introduce my guest today, Josh Olson, Executive Director, who began his career in advertising, and one of his clients was Angel Flight South Central based in Dallas, Texas. Josh's father and grandfather were both in the Air Force, so he was already enamored with aviation, but he took his wife, who was in the nonprofit sector, landing a job as the mission coordinator for Angel Flight West in Los Angeles to literally bring Josh on board. 
both to move to LA and to volunteer for AFW. I don't think it actually took too much convincing. Josh was then working in the entertainment industry, but with a child on the way and a high-risk pregnancy, Josh stepped in to assume the role of mission coordinator and was immediately faced with the challenging situation of a father from Montana who wanted to be with his wife and daughter as she was facing treatment for leukemia. This was his aha moment, and the stepping into this role became his calling, and he eventually became the executive director, and that was over 15 years ago. I am sure I'm not doing this incredible story justice, and Josh will add much more in a moment. My other guest is Mark Wolper, chair of the board of directors for Angel Flight West, as well as the president and executive producer of the Wolper organization, which together with his father, David, has been responsible for over 500 films, which have won more than 150 awards, including two Oscars, 50 Emmys, seven Golden Globes, five Peabody's, and recognition and retrospectives from Cannes and other respected international film festivals. I am in excellent company today, but I think Mark is most well known for his volunteer piloting at Angel Flight West, at least among his friends and family. And he's the one who's responsible for rescuing the puppies and his son flew alongside him to help. Definitely an inspirational family. So let's get started. Welcome Josh and Mark. Josh, let's start with you as executive director. I do feel like this has been a calling for you, and I'd love for you to speak to that. And then Mark, jump in and tell us your story and how you got connected. So Josh, you're on. Thanks, Laura. Appreciate it. And thanks for volunteering for Angel Flight and uh, helping us tell our story. I love the title of your podcast, Small and Gutsy, uh, because in the nonprofit space, a lot of my counterparts and us at Angel Flight is uh, you do have to be uh, gutsy. To, to not only serve the, the needs that we're trying to serve, um, but also to do it in a way that, that has vision and, and purpose and remain committed to that mission. So uh, uh, appreciate you having us. Um, and why I feel that this is a calling for me is one, you shared my personal story of you know helping someone that was in a similar situation as I was when my daughter was born, except his daughter um, had leukemia and, and had to be in Seattle Children's Hospital. And he lived in Montana. I lived in LA and my daughter was in a NICU that was uh, within walking distance of where I lived. The story hits home, right? Because of the, the human condition that we're all just, you know, one step, one choice, one situation away from, from being in need. Um, so it's all of our responsibilities to get back. And, and I feel that calling um, for sure. Um, my kind of talents and abilities, you know, you mentioned entertainment industry, um, you know, I'm a youngest child of four kids, so I've always grown up wanting to be the center of attention, and I've always been really good at making people laugh, making people cry, connecting, you know, on a variety of ways. I realized I was doing that a lot for my own benefit and attention, but instead serving others with that, it's a much more rewarding experience. And he does a great job at it too, by the way. <laughs> There's Thanks, no sir. question. I, I was privileged enough to attend your fundraiser so I can speak firsthand to that. It's not just transportation. You actually build relationships. And as someone who's now very involved in the medical care for my own personal reasons, I feel like those connections aid in my healing. So it's not just the transportation. I really want to make that point. There's a level of both reciprocity of you gain something from feeling good about having done something terrific for somebody else. And at the same time, you're giving them a, a sense of you matter, you care about them. And that alone can provide some healing for people. There are no words to express that level of dedication that you've just um, shared. And I love that you have this sense, you know, I can make people laugh. I can not necessarily want to make people cry, but I can make people feel and I can make people feel visible. And that's the piece that I just want to highlight. So I love your story. So I I want to go back to the program, but I want to bring Mark in for a second and hear, Mark, how did you get involved? What brought you to Angel Flight West? Well, you know, much like what Josh was talking about, this this idea of, you know, everything being centered about me, 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 or, you know, us, 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 or just my family. Um, I'm extremely lucky enough that I have a little airplane, right? A little single engine airplane. And I'll kind of explain what we do in, in telling this story. But I have this little tiny airplane. And, and then, you know, I'm at some aviation event and there's this little table set up. It says Angel Flight West. And we, you know, you can use your little airplane and 
fly people that need help from the middle of nowhere to Los Angeles or to San Francisco. And I'm like, oh, that sounds like fun. But I had an ulterior motive too. And Josh has heard this story before. I go, wait a minute, you know, here I am leaving the family for all day on Saturday to go flying. And the family's never particularly happy about that. Wait a minute, if I tell my wife that I'm going to fly a nonprofit thing in my airplane, mm -hmm. she'll be a little more okay with me flying. So maybe my original agenda was um, a little egotistical. <laughs> and I went and I flew my first mission, got in my little airplane, uh, flew out to Palm Springs, picked up a family, uh, and I flew them up to Oakland, to San Francisco for an appointment and waited for them and then flew them home. And I always get emotional about it. I, after after I landed in San Francisco, I realized this is why somebody gave me this airplane. This is why I have the airplane. Started flying missions. I got on the board. I became the board chair. And now I'm totally dedicated to this idea of how do we help these people get to the help that they need? You know, it's just an amazing organization. I think it's the first or second largest aviation nonprofit in the world. And there are affiliates all over, but this is specifically for the West Coast, correct? Yes, there are angel flights all across America. They're all sort of their, their own organization, but we all do exactly the same thing. And mm. we all work together to transport together and make a difference together. And was this the original one, though, in uh, Josh, you'll know, it was this the original one in LA, right? Yeah, the, the original angel flight. Yep was found at Santa Monica Airport. Yeah, that's what I thought. Um, mm -hmm. Mark, how long have you been connected to Angel Flight West? When did that first experience happen? How long ago? Wow, Josh, do you have any idea? I mean, Josh has been there as long as I've been there. Been there a little bit longer. Uh, I believe you were you were late 90s. Uh, and have been involved nonstop ever since then. And, you know, it's just, and it's so interesting because there's a thing about aviation. Most people don't like airports and don't like airplanes. They're noisy. Um, you know, there's issues with pollution. They take up land. People don't understand that there's a whole nother layer of aviation in airports that are critically important. So when I start telling people the story of, oh, did you know that, you know, all across the United States, every single day, there's like 300 or more little airplanes taking off and transporting veterans or animals, people that need health care or environmental work is being done all nonprofit from little airports and little airplanes from volunteer pilots. Our volunteer pilots, they just get up and they fl fly for free and pay for the fuel and pay for the maintenance and pay for the landing fees and pay for everything themselves just to get these people from one place to another place and give of their time because it takes a lot of time. And very often, especially with a health issue, you can't either you can't afford it, but you also can't health wise afford going on an airplane where the risk is so great to have a compromise when you're already your immune system is compromised. If a patient needed to go one time from their hometown to San Francisco, they could perhaps, of course, afford one flight or afford the one eight-hour drive and then the eight-hour drive back. But m most of, almost all of the patients are often doing this sometimes once a week, sometimes twice a week. Right. Uh, and then it becomes a very different issue when you have a small child that you know, you get up at, you know, four in the morning and you have to drive five or six hours to get them to the hospital for their chemotherapy. And then you, and then you get when they're at their worst moment of their life, you have to get them back in the car and drive another five right. or six hours home. Right. And you have to do this, you know, once a week or twice a week or once a month or whatever it is. It becomes a devastating um, impediment. And often people just won't go do what they need to do at the hospital because it's such a hurdle to overcome. Right. And these are huge barriers for folks. So uh, you're totally right. So Josh, walk us through the program. I know it, it obviously is flight-based, but there's also a driving component that maybe came a little bit later. So uh, tell us how it works. Tell me how it works. Our specific niche that we deal with are people that are going, you know, 50 to 100 miles or more to access healthcare. Things like clinical trials or, you know, specialty care that's not available in certain cities that is available in other cities. That's where where really we step in to 
to provide that link so that they can access that healthcare. Mm-hmm. Um, and you know, you mentioned it earlier. It's one of the few areas where everyone wins, right? The, the passenger desperately needs to get the healthcare they want to get the best uh, opportunity to thrive at life. The volunteer gets to do what they love, which is fly an airplane or, or as you mentioned, drive their car, meeting the pilot at the airport to take them to treatment. And then the healthcare facilities get to get to see patients that wouldn't otherwise be able to access their care to give them better health outcomes as well. So it is really one of those rare things that, you know, benefits everyone. So so how the system works is, is Angel Flight is really a platform. So most folks are familiar with Uber right now, right? We put opportunities out there for um, patients to request our services. So they're requesting how to get from point A to point B. And then we have all these volunteer pilots, similar to Uber has contract drivers that want to volunteer. And then we're just matching them up. So at our core, we're a volunteer matching system. Um, Of course, there's always a lot more to that. Most passengers learn about us through the uh, healthcare facility itself. So a social worker or patient navigator is saying, hey, you know, I noticed you've missed your last couple appointments. You said you had unreliable car issues. Maybe you should look into angel flight. Um, So the patient has to provide a medical release that's signed by a doctor saying they're okay to fly on a small small non-pressurized airplane um, and or a commercial airline if that is the situation and that their condition it isn't itself going to be affected or their condition isn't going to affect the safety of others on that flight. And then uh, they have to be ambulatory and medically stable, right? The, the nature of the aircraft itself, you have to be able to physically get on and off the aircraft um, from that sense. So it's not an air ambulance situation. These are all non-emergency situations. It's mostly outpatient treatment and it's some sort of, you know, advanced healthcare uh, rare treatment that's not available everywhere, clinical trial, other things. Once our coordination team has vetted all that needs, then we put that out on our website and app and then start um, outreach to our volunteers to see who can fly that together. You know, for someone like Mark, who says, you know what, next Friday, I don't have any meetings. I'm going to take, mm-hmm. you know, half a day off and go fly angel flights. He'll look on that board and say, oh, I see that there's someone coming from Bakersfield uh, into UCLA Children's Hospital, and uh, that timing works for me. So he'll sign up for that flight. Uh, We'll give him all the necessary documentation and information and so forth, and then really introduce them uh, via email. You know, the pilot meets them at an airport, gives them the whole pre-flight procedures and so forth so that they're familiar and comfortable and feel safe on, on board, and then... So that's kind of how the process works. The, the pilot themselves, as Mark said, are donating all the costs of the flight. Um, even if we could fundraise millions of dollars to reimburse fuel, the way that the FAA works is that the type of flying we're doing, which is non-commercial flying or charter flying, um, you actually can't receive compensation because it requires a different level of certification and control and so forth on the, on the flight. So they can't receive any kind of compensation becomes tax deductible for the volunteer. Um, so they do get a ben- an in-time benefit. The other volunteer, which you, you've gone through this process, so yeah. but for the listeners, I'll describe, uh, is called what we call Earth Angels or Autopilots. Gosh, did that come in much later? Is that a newer program or did that start almost at the same time? So the Earth Angel program uh, was actually founded by a volunteer pilot who would often get to an airport and then realize the patient that he was flying, didn't have access. And he, you know, in good conscience, couldn't leave them there without them getting where they needed to go. So he started driving them. And then, um, you know, he, he said, and these Mm -hmm. are his words, sort of selfishly, uh, I didn't want to drive. I just wanted to do the flying. So he approached his rotary group, uh, because they're always looking for service projects and said, Hey, would there be anyone interested in driving them? So they started this, they kicked off this program with us and we loved it because, Believe it or not, even though we can get people 500 miles from their home to treatment, that last mile or two, people were turning down our services because they couldn't afford it. They were intimidated by kind of a metro transportation system. So we we replicated the system that we did in Santa Monica throughout our area. Uh, and it's been another really great way to volunteer as well. So yeah, for sure. Yeah. So it's a really neat way to, to use. Um, most of us have a driver's license. A lot of us have access to a car 
Um, it's a pretty low level entry point into volunteering, um, but you're making a big impact. And as you said earlier, Laura, we have a phrase at Angel Flight saying that not all healing uh, happens at healthcare. The relationships formed by these volunteer drivers, and these volunteer pilots with patients often last a lifetime. The idea to be able to use my vehicle and my driver's license for good rather than going to the grocery store or whatever else I'm going to do is such an incredible feeling. And I've yet to do it, but signing up and going through the process, it was so thorough. And so I'll just speak as a volunteer, but hasn't yet done a mission. You're so organized and all of the things that you've thought of are so, make it so easy for a volunteer. So I really encourage people to step up if they can, because I don't think you can ever have too many volunteers because I'm guessing there are always more missions than there are people to be able to serve. Yeah, the need need for transportation far far outweighs the the resources to do so. And and we're just trying to grow into that need. In fact, I think it was uh uh UCLA Medical Center that, you know, did a little research on our behalf to try to understand what the need was and came back to us and reported that we were only getting 5% of the need for this kind of transportation. Just unbelievable because it's just so prevalent. People can't get to their appointments. And the thing is that you mentioned is, well, a couple things, and I know this from my own treatment, the consistency and the timing of having treatment on a regular basis is essential for a positive, for a good outcome, for a good prognosis. And so if people can't do it because there are these barriers, the likelihood that they won't continue completely impacts not only their own health, I'm going to say, but their loved ones, their family members, the people in their lives who care and love them, which gives rise for me to another question, which is sometimes people need either a translator to come with them for a medical appointment or someone who may not be a direct family member. And I just want you to speak to how you work that out with folks. When there's a language barrier, we, we do have uh, alternate languages spoken in our office. So we do have staff that um, specifically Spanish speaking skills, but um, a few others as well. We also have our documents translated in different um, languages, and we give our volunteers the opportunity to kind of hand a card that has the necessary information so that folks are briefed um, on what needs, you know, what is happening and what's about to happen and kind of the safety procedures associated with that. And patients can bring somebody along with them. That's correct. Yeah. You allow for yeah. that flexibility, which is what I wanted to have you share a bit. I think it's really important. Many people take companions along with them uh, and we can accommodate that. Needs change with passengers. Um, we try to be as flexible as we can and we ask them, we ask the passenger the same, if at all right. possible, to be flexible because, you know, unfortunately, as much as I wish I had um, Mother Nature on speed dial, we can't control the weather. Right. Uh, we, we can't control when a pilot is going through their, their pre-flight routine and they have a mechanical issue that it's right. not safe anymore to fly. So um, our, our coordinators are pretty talented and creative in that art of coordinating a flight. So, so we do have other opportunities uh, we have a fund that folks donate to that in the event that one of these things happen or we can't find a volunteer that we pay for a commercial flight on occasion or pay for lodging or in the case where we can't find an earth angel, you know, we, we pay for an Uber or Lyft uh, to get the patient where they need to go. Josh was just talking about our mission coordinators. I mean, this is like control center. I mean, these are people in there <laughs> taking these calls and coordinating the missions and talking to pilots and talking to patients and talking to hospitals and figuring this out all, you know, very, very quickly so they could get on to the next one. And it's an amazing team of people that also, by the way, it's, you know, and Josh alluded to this, you know, we have airline partners too, uh, Alaska Airlines, Hawaiian, Hawaiian Air. So these are partners that are often giving us a, a, a lot of free, a certain amount of free seats a year that we can portion out as we need them. And then of course the pilots, you know, the majority of our volunteer pilots, most of them have a little airplane that's like a hobby, right? Instead of having a fancy, you know, an old fashioned car that they work on in their garage or, you know, some other hobby they have that a little airplane is their hobby. So these are smaller airplanes and pilots of often, you know, more resources than a lot of people, but not a lot of resources and giving of the time and the fuel and everything. I mean, this is, these are 
amazing volunteers, amazing people that are going out in their little airplanes on hot days sometimes, paying for their own fuel and getting in there and fuel prices go up. We see our mission of, you know, mission pilot volunteers going down because they just can't afford to pay for the gas themselves. And they're calling the coordinators going, is there a shorter flight? Is there something? Because they're so desperate to help, but mm -hmm. they, and they can't afford to do it so sometimes. That, so what's also great is it gives um, the possibility of maybe raising money for fuel in those situations. Well, so we can't we can't give them fuel. Oh, that's right. We can't yeah, we can't offer them the fuel. So, but right. a lot of the fuel companies actually give us discounts. So they give the pilots, you know, discounts. Yeah, um, or they could for, do a whole donation of maybe the I don't know if the fuel. Well, we're companies constantly can do working that. on that. Believe me, you know, shows like Small and Gutsy getting the work out helps us with with these partners i mean they try to they try to volunteer and do that and some mm -hmm. some airports require you to pay a, a fee for landing there not all of them most don't but some do but that we definitely airports have always been fantastic about that about you know not making yeah. if you're doing a volunteer flight um they're not making you pay the landing fee the, the things that you have to go through and organize and coordinate and make sure it's streamlined and it works for the patient, the pilot, the driver, everything is enormous. There are lots of hands on deck. There are lots of resources needed. And Mark Wolper, I see a series, a TV series in the future here that could be revenue bringing for this organization. I'm totally teasing you. But I, I do what I want to point out. We've considered yeah, that. I, Don't get I, me wrong. We have considered I could that. totally see it. It'd be the first series, and I could be wrong about this, but it could be the first series where a certain percentage is given back to an organization. Wouldn't that be setting a trend? That would be it gutsy, would be wouldn't gutsy. it? That would be I gutsy. this idea the more we think about it. And it's so worthwhile because it's so beautifully organized. So for somebody who's volunteered a lot in her life, this is an organization where you've laid it out so easily. Uh, and I really appreciate that. And I encourage all of my listeners in the LA area to check you out and think about becoming a volunteer. And if you happen to be a pilot, please sign up for a mission and go through that process. Because as you heard, Mark got choked up in the very beginning. It's very emotional. You're really helping folks repeatedly. And I want to add one other comment to that that I heard, uh, that you do, you will also help people who are in a clinical trial. And for somebody who is on a medication that almost didn't get uh, agreed to by my insurance company, it was sort of cutting edge. And, and for my particular case, and they did, not having that might make the difference for my future. And so clinical trials are so important for folks. They're, yeah, they're important for the patient and they're important for the hospital as well. Absolutely. The hospitals are desperate to bring as many patients as in as they can for those clinical trials. And so often when they identify, you know, patients that will, that could use that clinical trial, you know, Josh talking about that triangle of the patient, the hospital and the pilot that all, you know, go to hospitals sometimes to tell them the service and they don't believe us when we tell them it's free. They're like, well, wait a minute, what do you want from us? We go, no, we don't, we don't want anything from you. Just tell us where the patient is and we'll get them to you. And they're, they're, they don't quite believe us until we do the first right. couple of missions for them and they go, oh, wow, okay, this is for real. I think most people can't quite believe that people will volunteer their time and their energy and their own resources to do this. And I, you know, I think about Small and Gutsy. It's now a nonprofit, but for you know, a couple of years... Uh, it was, and it is completely pro bono. And v invariably, I'll always get a, an organization, an interviewee who will say, well, do I, what do I have to pay? And I'm like, nothing. They're like, really? You're doing this? And I'm like, yeah, because your organization is really cool and it's gutsy and you're doing amazing things. And I have to add one other piece to the clinical trial, which it is better for the general public because the more these clinical trials are accomplished and we get results, the more we can apply them, and that's why I'm on a particular medication that I would two years ago I wouldn't have been able to be on, 
is because there were trials and it was successful and it was successful in my situation, even if I were on the borderline. And so I'm deeply indebted and appreciative of all of the uh, clinical trials and the fact that you fly for those as well is fantastic. Well, we should talk a little bit and Josh should probably talk about it too, but for our volunteer pilots, one of the favorite things we do, especially every summer is our camps. I love that. Yeah, please. Yeah, so we don't just fly for healthcare reasons. We'll, we'll, consider any compelling human need. Um, and some of the favorite flights for a lot of our volunteers is we'll, we partner with other nonprofits. For example, the Elise Ann Rouge Burn Foundation has a camp in Fresno where it's run all by firefighters or other survive, burn survivors. Mm -hmm. um, but they pull kids from Nevada, Southern California, Northern California, and they all go to this camp for two weeks where there's other kids that look like them, right? They have burn scars. They have, you know, stories from their past of why they're burned and they get to share those and feel safe and comfortable, you know, like a lot of great camps, summer camps do when you're a kid, right? Like that first day, you're always a little wary of what everybody else is, but by the end, you're all best friends. So getting to this camp often isn't a possibility for many of them, especially those that live far away. So being able to have a, a volunteer pilot usually pick up multiple campers and fly them up to the camp and then fly them home um, is really meaningful to them. Uh, and the pilots love it too. Usually the kids are kind of very excited and nervous on the way there. And then they're so exhausted by the time <laughs> they, they come sleep home on the way back yeah, right. and uh, have way too much luggage because of all the stuff they've made at camp and that are trying to like, you know, fit into their airplanes. Aww, but um but the camp does a great job organizing our coordinators do a great job because that that is a lot of flights going in and out of the same place. So it's always fantastic to arrive at these airports and see, you know, 30 or 40 other airplanes all coming in at sort of the same time, the tower working to get them in and and then all the kids getting out of the airplanes and the pilots are trying to wrangle them and keep them safe as we get them over to the building and they're so excited and they're running, you know, on their thing. And, you know, you, you think about these camps and about, I mean, we do the deaf camp and the burn camp and uh, other kinds of camps and, and I've flown a lot of them and, you know, it's so, it's so amazing how when you see the kids individually they're very quiet and reserved and you know a little bit uncomfortable with an adult you know they're on an airplane and then you pick up one kid and then you go to the next airport and you pick up the other kid and now the two of them that are both have the same situation right have the same they light up they're suddenly in the airplane and they're talking to each other and you pick up the third one and i remember on one of my flights and it was just like I'm sitting in the front listening to them on my headsets as I, I'm flying them and they're sitting in the back and this is how comfortable they get with each other. They go, this is a burn camp and they're like, they're going, okay, let's tell stories. Who has the worst burn story? <laughs> <laughs> and they start so right. comfortably talking right. about because their someone else gets it because somebody yeah. else gets it and I'm mm -hmm. sitting in the front and go I get now why these camps are so important oh they're so important ecstatic and energetic and running and Josh is right then you go pick them up and they're like like they're dragging their bags, they're exhausted. And they also don't want to come home because it's the one place where they feel oh, yeah, there's often actually tears. seen yep. and not discriminated against, I hate to say. So I did an interview a couple of years ago of a camp in on the East Coast, actually, and it's called Harbor Camps. And they started initially as an LBGT, but T, mostly trans, kids who were questioning. And this was the first time kids would feel like they could be themselves. And then the camp expanded into skeletal dysplasia and I think facial. And so these are, they had a medical component and so they had to have, you know, medical care on site. And it was really amazing because these kids for the first time could just be kids, could just be kids at camp. Whereas very often they don't have that luxury because of what's occurred to them and, or was a genetic situation or something that happened. And you've described the same situation. These kids actually, for the first time, get to talk about it in a way that builds comfort and connection and, you know, fraternity, sorority, whatever you want to call it, but a commonness that allows them to really be kids at camp yep. and have fun. Yeah. And it's a, it's beautiful. So I love that you've added that piece. And how many summers have you done that? Probably close to 30 summers. 
And Laura, you you bring up a great point, um, and I feel remiss in not saying it, even sharing the story of your camp. Um, you know, I mentioned we we consider other compelling needs. So, you know, your audience specifically being nonprofits, if there's other nonprofits out there that you know transportation is a barrier for them to pull off their mission, that we can help. We love those partnerships. So we we do a um, there's a search and rescue dog. A uh, nonprofit that we partner with in Santa Barbara that brings in dogs to train them in Santa Barbara and then sends them out to these other areas and and uh, again all nonprofit. So we love flying those dogs in. Um, there's some blood banks that we partner with. You can get there that there in a time effective manner. You can get the plasma and the white cells and the other things. So you can again impact more lives. So we've done those types of flights. We partner with domestic violence shelters to relocate to a safe space with their family, all confidentially. And so if there is someone listening to that and they're like, oh yeah, we struggle getting kids from this part of the state to our camp or you know, whatever the case might be, um, that, that's a compelling human need, we, we'd be happy to help. That's great. And conversely, if you have any partners that are under 10, 10 million that wanna have a pro bono interview, you know, let me know or let them know and they can reach out to me directly. Yeah, there's a there's a website you can Google called Air Care Alliance, but it lists all those based on the different needs. Um, so that's a good way for yeah other nonprofits or anyone that's looking for help for a particular need. It's a good good way to find those uh, other groups. And we also and and I'll do a shout out to you know parallel nonprofit organizations that we also work with occasionally. So there are other nonprofit aviation organizations. We're a little broader, but there's other ones that specialize on very specific things. So there, there'll be a nonprofit aviation group that just transports veterans, you know, and veterans families back and forth to each other. There's other ones that just do environmental work. So if an, uh, an environmental scientist needs to get up in the air to do a study, those nonprofit aviation groups will do that. There's other ones that transport, very popular one that transports animals to non-kill areas um, that, that just do animals in airplanes. And we on occasion partner with these because if they can't figure this mission out since we have the, one of the largest volunteer bases we can put the word out to our volunteers hey this group is looking for somebody to do this mission there's a lot of networking that happens it keeps us all viable you know allows us to help you know a broader constituency and you know just get in giving back so that begs the question how do people find you it's www.angelflightwest.org you can also call uh, our offices at any time uh, 310-390-2958. And then uh, you can find us on social media. We're always at Angel Flight West uh, on Facebook, Instagram, X, I guess, formerly known as Twitter. <laughs> mm. And it's not just it's not just for volunteer pilots. I mean, we mentioned drivers, but even if you don't have a car or an airplane, uh, we utilize a lot of volunteers to help us do the kind of day-to-day -day tasks. So that could be hauling volunteer pilots on upcoming flights, uh, it could be some data entry in our uh, database that where we manage all these flights. Uh, it could be throwing a fundraising event or an awareness building campaign or speaking with a group of social workers. There's all sorts of ways to get involved. So uh, if there's anything we've said that have piqued your interest uh, and makes you want to want to get involved, we, we welcome it. It really does take a village to do what we do. We've got thousands of volunteers and just about a dozen on our staff so support your local airport as well understand and support why your local airport is there we can't do our work if we don't have the places to land and take off right that's so true what's generally the lead time that somebody needs if they're a patient they call and they have you know they've just gotten notice that they need to have a certain uh, number of appointments what generally what is that i mean i know there are some that might be last minute that you can jump in yeah in general um it's we need five days notice because we are working with volunteer schedules and we have to get all the paperwork and so forth um in advance, um, that that's for our our volunteer pilots. For our commercial airline partners, uh, usually forty eight. Amazing! It's fabulous. And then uh, the other thing is that what's your catchment area specifically? I'm unfamiliar with that term catchment. Oh, sorry. Okay, that's, okay. that's the I'm I'm a social worker by training, which reminds me, I want to volunteer to talk to social workers, even oh, though, cool. yeah, I'd love to do it. Oh my gosh, that's like my I'm homegrown. That would be great. 
catch areas is sort of what's your region? Where do you where do you provide oh, gotcha. services? I am so sorry. That's in my lingo. I no, you're good. New today. Yeah, so, so Angel Fly West uh, covers the western half of the United States, so Montana down to New Mexico and west, including Alaska and Hawaii. Um, and then there's other angel flights that we work with closely in other parts of the country where that transportation would be uh, need to be bridged. And then, um, in fact, the, this model has been so popular, it's now replicated in different parts of the world. So there's an angel flight Australia, there's an angel flight in Canada, um, there's a, a helicopter only group that does similar things in Ireland. Um, so it, it's neat. It's, uh, it shows you that the need is real and the, uh, the resources are creative to meet that need. And um, we need more of that uh, in our country and in our world, quite frankly. Absolutely. No question. It certainly, you know, the whole idea of what's really meaningful and what matters hopefully changes the nature of that concept of being an individual versus a collectivist society. And I really want to be a collectivist, collaborative society. So one other quick thought I have, and then we'll move into our quick and gutsy questions, if you're okay, before we end the podcast. Sure. I'm happy to talk with social workers in person, and I'm also happy to host a Zoom for social workers who may not be right in the LA area. And so once I'm a little more educated and maybe run a mission myself, I would be delighted to help folks recognize that when they have clients or patients, that you're the folks that they call who are in need in this way. So I love that, particularly maybe in the alternative needs as well, not just medical, but domestic violence or um, the camp piece or other services, because it's how you get referrals too. So I'm happy to do that. You're amazing, Lori. You probably make this offer to every <laughs> single one of the small and gutsy I organizations don't. you talk I... to. I'm surprised you have any time <laughs> to take care of yourself. Okay. The truth is I do fall in love with absolutely every organization I work with, but I, but you all, because of my husband, Mark, and sort of our experience with you and our personal relationship with Mark Wolper, I am in in a different way. I do what I can for as many as I can, but honestly, I'm in as a volunteer in a different way with you all. So take advantage, especially as my energy starts to come back. And, you know, for a while I was too low energy to do much and I'm coming back to life and it's due to the care that I received. And so to pay it forward makes me feel absolutely wonderful. Specifically, it would be great to, to work with you all and I'd be delighted to do it. So, are you all ready for the quick and gutsy questions as we close the podcast? Ready. Okay. Yeah, let's go. What is at the top of your wish list for Angel Flight West? But the answer can't be money or funding. What would be at the top of your wish list? And you each get an answer. Uh, well, I know Josh is going to say the same thing as me. I just know it. Um, it's serving serving more people. Yeah, same. I, I wish we could more meaningfully contribute to this need. Uh, I mean, I, sh I shouldn't say more meaningfully. I think what we do is incredibly meaningful, um, but the, the scope and scale, at which was much, much greater. If you were to think of a song that describes Angel Flight West, what would it be? It's almost too cheesy and easy, right? But it's Wind Beneath My Wings. Yeah, I love that. That's great. It's not cheesy. I think it's great. And Mark, do you have one? That was Josh's. I, you know, I always go to the top gun theme a little bit because you know i'm a pilot and so you know what it's fun as a pilot to feel a little bit like we're top gun guys you know we're flying we're flying a mission and yeah you you're know, heroes I, I put that music on sometimes yeah. at a lot of our you know events we're always playing that song um especially these days with, you know, the latest one. So, you know, we're pilot geeks, we're airplane geeks. Uh, and then we have to think of one for driving, for the drivers. I'll think about that one, you know? You already mentioned early on, Josh, but I'm going to ask this question anyway. What do you think makes Angel Flight West gutsy? How is your organization gutsy? And you both get an answer for this because it's definitely gutsy. I think the answer includes kind of each one of our audiences. I, I find our passengers incredibly gutsy. Um, you know, being faced with a potentially terminal illness uh, and not taking the answer that we don't have treatment locally available is, is that's not your no, right? And, and they're doing things that they would normally not do, like fly on a small airplane, which is a fear for some folks. I think our volunteers are incredibly gutsy to to be so generous, to offer, you know, incredibly valuable resources to really a stranger. 
I think our our staff members are incredibly gutsy. Um, it is, you know, we we talked about this art of mission coordination, and and that skill set is really hard, and those those people are really hard to find. But then also what you deal with on a day-to-day -day basis is hard, right? You get you become friends with these people that you're talking on the phone with and you're arranging flights for, and oftentimes they are an in stage agency. We end up losing them. And it's sad. It's just it's incredibly sad. Um and then, you know, there have been a handful of times where, you know, we've lost a volunteer pilot, not necessarily on an angel flight, but same thing. These incredible people that that you get to know and love, and then you know they're tragically taken away from you suddenly. That's that's it's gutsy to hang in there and keep doing that and keeping your eyes on the bigger prize, right? You face loss on a regular basis in a lot of lots of different ways, and so being gutsy is okay. We're going to face loss, but we're showing up anyway. You you put it much more eloquently than me. I love that. <laughs> no. No. Um, Mark, what about you? What would you say? Well, I, I'm I'm going to jump to a broader thing, and I think it speaks to our stat, to the staff at Angel Flight, in, including yeah. Josh. Many of us volunteer. Yeah. Oh, I'm going to volunteer a couple times a year, or oh, on Christmas, I'm going to go down and, and do whatever. The staff have made a lifelong decision to exist in the nonprofit world. Yes. Every single day. That's gutsy. Mm -hmm. It's not that they're not, they're not, volunteering they're getting paid right they're making a living doing it but they've made a choice that that is their career to be career nonprofit people those are amazing people that's gutsy to make that decision i love that you said that yeah because i've been in the space for a long time i i think that's beautiful and we don't think about that enough and we don't think about uh, the the kind of concept of compensation and the inequity that exists between nonprofit and for profit and part of why I started small and gutsy is because you can't use public dollars for marketing. I can't think of a business on the face of the earth that doesn't use dollars to market. Like it makes no sense. You wouldn't be in business. What is something that outsiders or maybe even a few insiders don't know about Angel Flight West? It's a hidden, it's a hidden, amazing secret that it's out there that when you look up and you hear a little airplane and we all look up when we see a little airplane, many of those are on their, their microphones talking to the tower going angel flight 16, you know, blah, blah, blah. I'm often in the air flying either an angel flight or flying for work or something. And I'll hear other airplanes going angel flight 265, blah, blah, blah. You go, they're up here. The angels are up there. The level of um, detail and coordination that it takes to pull this off um, is, you know, like a lot of our volunteers, even when they, you know, we, we get this a lot. We invite everyone to an annual retreat. We kind of go through the numbers and how things work. And in, 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 invariably, people are like, wow, I had no idea that this was going on. I thought, you know, <laughs> I get this little notification on my phone. I say, yes, I go pick up a a patient like I didn't know all of you know all of what it take, takes to kind of pull this off, um, and and I think it's a real credit to um, our volunteer leadership like Mark and even our founders that they created this sort of volunteer driven organization that that leans on this village of volunteers right literally thousands with a really small staff uh, and some good technology to kind of pull it all off, and I I think you know. The, the proverbial duck on the water with the, the feet paddling underneath, that is us, right? Except that we take off too, right? If you could get one celebrity or influencer, sorry, Mark Wilper, we're excluding you from that one, okay? No, you get to answer the question, but it can't be you. Um, if you could get one celebrity or influencer to endorse, talk about, celebrate, you know, put it on their Facebook page or whatever. The Facebook's, I guess, my age. I should maybe do like TikTok or something. Um, who might that be to really push your organization and really celebrate it? Uh, there, there's two that we always talk about and and try to coordinate, and and they're always open to it. But we've, you know, never really like sealed them in. And one of the obvious ones is Harrison Ford because he's a pilot and he's a celebrity and. Is he he uh, keeps his plane at Santa Monica Airport, which is where our headquarters is. So he seems like a, a great one. And Angelina Jolie, who has actually flown some missions, not not for Angel Flight West, but for other aviation nonprofits that we work with, 
um, she would be she'd be great too. Those are two that come right to mind. Mine's going to be a little uh, not as intuitive, but uh, I would actually really love the Walton family. So the the founders of Walmart, they're all really big aviators, and they have become experts at connecting rural areas with urban to give them the same access. So. I, I really feel like one, their personal passion for flying, but also their institutional knowledge of ha ha having to do that and, and the resources to pull it off would be like a, a home run for angel flights uh, across the country and across the world. Because as we talked about that uh, need to kind of scale um, to a size where we can make a bigger impact on this transportation healthcare problem, I feel like they would as celebrities um, be among the best position to help us do that. That is a really interesting idea. And they could, you could use one of their large parking lots for a landing strip. No, I'm totally teasing. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. How, how about the, uh, how, that's a great one, Josh. We got to work on that. How about the, how about the angel Gabriel? Yeah. The angel Gabriel. Boy, that would be great too. So you've hit all these areas, right? So you've hit the spirituality, religious part. You've hit the celebrity piece. And then also the um, the the indi yeah the corporate the the uh, industry which is fabulous. So one question that I didn't ask before, which I'm going to ask each of you, that's not one of the quick and gutsies, and then we'll close off our podcast. I'd love. I'm sure there are many, and this is an unfair question, but I'd love um, for each of you to share one of the many kind of aha moments for you or heartfelt or and mark i know you did in your very first flight but if there's another one that just speaks to you with you don't have to sh obviously not sharing names but just the experience i'd love for you each to share a story angel flight gives gives you lots of these types of stories but um the one that came to mind when you asked that question there is a young man that we served for uh probably six or seven years uh, his name was lonnie and he was developmentally delayed and was born with a congenital heart defect that he had to have heart surgeries regularly to kind of preserve his life. And he had a, a host of other healthcare issues. He would fly often into our offices and he would come in and he was one of those people that you meet and can't not love. Um, and then as, as I got to know him more and unfortunately sometimes got pulled into situations where things weren't good. Um, so he didn't have a great home situation he on his own volition kind of found this program at UCLA and he would go to these conferences and he would do all the research. He would research the bus system. So this is before we had earth angels. The, the first part was before we had earth angels. Then we had earth angels that would sign up for him anytime they saw, because they loved driving him. Anyhow, he knew he wasn't going to make it long, both because of his heart condition and his developmental uh, delay. Um, but he was, he never took no for an answer. And he had this kind of outlook on life that, you know, he, he, he never wanted to, um, to say no. The, the end of this story was he ended up being in a hospital for a long time at UCLA towards the end. And he ended up being there over the holidays. Um, and so different staff members from Angel Flight would swing by UCLA on the way to or from work and, you know, say hi or whatever. Um, I started taking my kids with me. And, I'm giving you uh, so a tissue because I'm using one. They got to know yeah. Lonnie really well. <laughs> they got to know Lonnie really well. And um, my wife knew him too because she was working at Angel Flight at the time. So we just always had a heart, soft spot for him. So we went on Christmas morning and he was alone, which was sad in and of itself. But he lit up when we got in. He got super excited. And we said, you know, Lonnie, what? what can we do for you? Can we, do you want to just sit and talk? And he said, could you, could you sing me Christmas carols, <laughs> Christmas carols? So he had certain ones that he liked and we just sat there and sang Christmas carols and, you know, he's hooked up to tubes and all these things, but he just, he had a really great smile. He just like laid back and he just smiled that whole time we got to sing to him. So that was really special for me. Yeah, really beautiful. So as I, you mentioned before, your service goes well beyond the actual driving or flying. And so I really want people to understand that, that these are relationships that get built over time. And I think that was a beautiful, not just for Lonnie, but for your family. It was a way you gave back as a family that probably still, I'm guessing, inspires your wife and your children. And you've done Yeah, so we do talk about it. You know, at the time, it was funny because they're, you know, they're little, 
they were they were pretty young when we were taking them and they didn't you know Lonnie was a little different so they didn't understand a lot right it caused a lot of questions but now as they're older yeah it's a really really great memory that we remember together yeah it's beautiful thank you thank you for sharing that Mark what about you well that that first one will always that I mentioned will always be you know monumental and there's you know as Josh said they're just there's so many stories every story is so unique but I'm just I'm going to shift it to just something completely different because the normal thing would be to talk about the, the patients and and that's so emotional and strong but I want to talk about the volunteer pilots a little bit because there's two amazingly phenomenal things that that always happen whenever a tragedy happens anywhere in the world particularly in the United States our associate executive director, Sherry, who's head of the missions, phone lights up every time, every single pilot. How, how can we help? What can we do? They're all on the phone like this immediately. Like it's, it could be, it's not even in our region. And these pilots are, we need to help. What can we do? And, you know, Sherry will do her best to, and we'll contact and we actually helped in, you know, in the hurricane in New Orleans and and we do, and the mudslides we had in California. So we end up helping in a lot of these missions, but the the immediacy of the pilots to jump to help. And as a result of that, Josh very smartly and our IT, IT team came up with, so we're, you know, he talked about that five days when we're getting down, you know, to the five day limit and a patient hasn't found a mission, we send out a text to all the pilots and, and, and inevitably, multiple pilots will see that realize oh no somebody's in trouble and take the mission it's a beautiful it's a beautiful community that you've built so the what it speaks to is that people do really want to be there and people do want to help and you've created this not only this feeling but this actuality that no one's alone You've really created this, that we are not alone. And in so many instances where we often do feel alone, the reality is you've created an entity, Angel Flight West, where people are not alone. People step in when they need to. And that is irreplaceable. It's absolutely beautiful. <sighs> okay, let me do a little deep breathing, <laughs> decompress from my own tears. Those are beautiful. I love I love those stories. And I and I'm and Mark, thank you for pointing out the pilot piece because it's beautiful and it, it's a piece of what keeps this going as well is the community and the feeling that has exudes from Angel Flight West. So that's really the end of our podcast. I want to thank you both for taking this time with me to share Angel Flight West, a bit of the history, your own uh, experience, how you entered, your contributions how you keep it going, that it takes an army of folks, even though it doesn't look like that. Uh, and that it's a shout out for everyone to check out your website, volunteer. If you happen to be a pilot, jump in. If you happen to have a driver's license, jump in. And, um, and even if you're from another part of the country, call and find out and it, you'll get connected. And most, not most importantly, but additionally, if you want to be a partner, if you want to be an organizational partner in some way where you can support, guide, refer, help, jump in. So thank you both. Really appreciated your thank time. Thank you, Laura. Uh, really enjoyed it too. Uh, and thanks for your heart for others as well. Uh, it shines through. Yeah, thank you, Laura. You know, shouting out for all the nonprofits is, is a, a, an amazing um, way to help because we need all the help we can get. For sure. It's a beautiful thing what you've done. And so here's to another 40 years. Cheers. 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 All of the small and gutsy episodes can be found on the Intrinsic Group website, which has a small and gutsy page. The opinions and viewpoints expressed by our guests are independent and do not reflect the position of small and gutsy. Of course, we can't take responsibility outside of our own vetting of the organizations we interview. So before you sign on to support or work for them, we encourage you to do your own due diligence and research them as well. We just want you to learn about the small and gutsy nonprofit and social impact organizational sector so they can spread their story and their impactful work. I want to thank my partners in this endeavor, the Intrinsic Group, my brilliant sound engineer and composer, Pavel Franson, my very talented graphic designer, Nate Addy, 
please check out their bios on the Intrinsic website. My incredible board of directors, Tracy Brown, John Gatto, Lucy Mello, Serena Rajabian, who believed in me and this project enough so to sign on to support this effort and all of the folks, friends, and family who have guided and inspired me. A very special thank you to my biggest champion, number one fan, and best friend, without whom none of this would be possible. Thanks, Mark Wickoff. Thanks for being there. And thank you for listening. If you like this podcast, please share it with your friends, give us some stars, and write a review on wherever you listen to podcasts. From small and gutsy to big with impact, I'm Laura Whitcoff. Thanks for listening.